So yes, we were just talking about the uh, why we're doing this. Um, that we try to connect the local founders with the global investors. And this is why we're having uh, Sophia here today. And the um, little bit about the agenda today is that we will start with a little bit of presentation from Sophia to talk about index ventures. And then we'll have the Q&A uh, section from the founders. Um, Sophia, feel free to get started. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here and happy to share a bit more about Index, who we are, where our investments are focused and how we're thinking about venture going forward and briefly touch on myself. So um, have prepared a bit of a summary. So just taking a step back, Index Ventures is a global venture capital firm that was founded 25 years ago now by, by our founders in Geneva and the whole premise behind Index was our founders had spent a lot of time on the West Coast and in, 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 in the US and were really inspired by the Silicon Valley way of investing, which at the time what was really foreign here in Europe. And you really had to go to the US to seek capital and, and it, oftentimes access to talent at the time. So they founded Index in Geneva because it's the heart of Europe. And so the mission was we're going to fly everywhere to build relationships, meet entrepreneurs in person, and make sure that we can write the first, che first checks into companies all over Europe. And so that's really the genesis and has founded Index since in that we're very relationship driven. Um, and for us, it's much more than just a transaction. It's an investment and it's a, it's, it's, it's a marriage. It's a lifelong relationship throughout that time of the, of the investment. Um, since we have expanded, so we're duly headquartered between London and San Francisco today, where I am based in London. And we're about 10 investors in London, 10 investors in San Francisco, and we invest from three vehicles. So the three vehicles are a um, $200 million seed fund, just dedicated to writing the first checks into company, being the first investor. Secondly, we have an $800 million venture fund where we invest up to $20 million per ticket and the bread and butter is series A. And then lastly, we have a $1.2 billion growth fund where we can invest all the way up until pre-IPO. So very much a multi-stage firm um, that can partner and, and really be a long-term um, long partner to, to, to companies that we work with. As for sectors, historically, we've divvied this up into three areas. So about a third of our investments are in consumer and marketplace related companies where I personally spend a lot of time. About a third is in B2B, so software, SMEs, all the way to enterprise. And then lastly, the, the final third is, is in fintech. So we have, we have a long history of investing in fintech companies across the value chain, whether it's um, payment processing enabling, such as Adyen back in the day, or whether it's neobanks like Revolut, or whether it's infrastructure to enable open, open banking, such as Plaid. So um, those are the three areas where, where we spend time. And as for how we try to work with companies is, as I alluded to, it's not just a transaction. For us, it's very relationship driven. So um, the way we support companies is really in a multitude of ways. The first one is through talent, where we have a full-time talent team that's solely dedicated to identifying kind of the next gen superstars across product, tech, marketing, sales, whatever function it might be across Europe. Um, helping companies hire, recruit, and sometimes relocate, although in today's world, maybe that's that's less of an issue. Um, so that, that that's an area where we spend a lot of time and we tend to sort of pride ourselves on being glorified recruiters and that we spend so much of our time interviewing candidates. And, and that's how I work with a lot of the companies where I'm on the board. It's all just about optimizing for talent and ensuring that um, we can help support with that. The second area where we spend a lot of time is on corporate development. So we have um, a core dev team also just dedicated to building out all our relationships with C-level execs at whether it's large financial institutions, banks, whether it's Fortune 500 companies or FMCG. And then depending on the company that we're supporting, we can help facilitate those introductions and, and you know cultivate meaningful relationships there to try to help our companies transact and ultimately grow and, and, and build relationships with those, with those um, um, you know, larger scale companies as potential customers for them down the line. So that's where we spend a lot of time. And then lastly, just on international expansion. So Index as a fund itself, we're a case study of somebody expanding from Europe to the US. You know, we started in Geneva, then London, 
Then 10 years after we did that, we set up shop in San Francisco and we're now 10 years into our US journey. And so we have also gone through that journey of starting something in the US coming from Europe and um, have supported a number of our companies in Europe to do that in the US, whether in the Nordic, say it's King on the gaming side or whether it's Zendesk uh, in, in, in more the B2B customer service side. These are both examples of companies that we've helped them expand to the US. Um, and it's, it's an area where we spend a lot of time with our company. So we can set up roadshows for them to make sure they um, get introductions to, to folks in the US, think about where it's best for them to actually be based from a time zone perspective, cultural perspective, access to talent perspective, um, whether it's if it's a consumer company to think about logistics dimensions, all those things. Um, and, and in a similar vein, we do the same for, for, your, for European expansion. So really help strategize and uh, make sure that they have a game plan in place for uh, for for expansion across Europe. And so I, I'm personally involved with one of our investments in Sweden, and it's one where we've done a lot of work in that regard with their expansion to, to the UK, to France, and to Germany since our initial investment now a few years ago. So those are that's how we typically support companies. And as I mentioned, we're a long-term investor to our companies. We ourselves have long-term LPs that are backers of our fund that we have long-term relationships with. So these are, you know, nonprofits, their universities, their foundations. So very long-term oriented investors that, that that we feel fortunate to have as backers. And that's really the the philosophy that we that we operate in. So I think that was about 10 minutes. So I'll pause there and 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 see if there are any questions and happy to go deeper in any direction. That, that you'd like, but but as for an overview, I'll, I'll, I'll pause it at that. Thank you so much, Sophia, for the introduction. And the, for the founders, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Yes, well, in that case, um, like you talk, yes, I will go with my questions. Uh, so Sophia, you talk about the, uh, the index, uh, index origin, the uh, $200 million uh, like seed fund. Uh, that you guys started uh, at the beginning of this year. So what made your team decide to start a seed fund during the pandemic? Yeah, so we've found that there has always been misconception around index and seed. So we've actually been doing seed for a very long time. Some of our actually best investments have come from seed. So we were the first check into Deliveroo, into Robinhood, into Figma, um, in, in you know, many others, those are into Revolut. So those are a few examples. And those are today companies that have had meaningful returns for us or are our, 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 our big value drivers for us. Um, so we've always done seed, but given we it came out of our venture fund, it was often misunderstood and not clear for entrepreneurs that they could in fact reach out to us. And we were in fact approachable even for, for very small check sizes. So in a way it was a means for us to formalize that strategy and make sure that it was clear that we are in fact seed investors and we have a dedicated fund to that now. As for um, how we think about that fund, we're not optimizing for ownership with this fund, we're optimizing for exposure and collaboration. So we think about it as a way to collaborate with angel investors, local seed funds, other solo GPs, and then we can work together with them at the origin stage and then index can be the next lead investor say in the subsequent round from some of our other funds. So it was, it was really, that was kind of the rationale for, for doing it. And as for timing, in our view, the venture market has never been more exciting in Europe from both a capital access perspective, but also just talent perspective. I think today there are more full stack engineers in Europe than there are in the US. So just from a tech and product perspective, Europe has never been more ripe. And so we felt like now was the best time to also make sure that the, the market knew we were we were available for, for seed investing and we felt like we had something that was a differentiated offer to what's available. And you, like other firms, they invest in deals and uh, you, like in your website, you said index investing people. So what kind of people, founders, specific are you looking for? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So. Exactly that, index we invest in founders. And so much of our kind of filtering process comes down to a lot of subjective filtering. 
I'm less about, you know, I have so many companies come up to me asking, you know, what kind of AR do I need to reach for it to be interesting to index? And it's just sort of approaching it from a different way, the way we think about it. We think that it's much more about the nature of the product, the engagement, you know, do customers love it? And if they do, then, you know, traction from a financial perspective will come over time if there's customer love. And in order to get to that realization and sort of that thoughtfulness, it comes back to, to the founder, you know, how are they approaching this product and this market from first principles? And how are they thinking long-term so that they're building early on strategic moats, they're really, um, you know, honing in on what makes them obsessed about making this product 10 times better than all the other things that exist in the market. Um, so it's really understanding those subjective filters and honing in on why the founder is working on this or founding team. And, you know, do they have the level of grit that you need to be able to go through all the ups and downs that is involved in the startup journey? And, and, and are you in it ultimately for the long term? And are you humble and self-aware enough to realize where maybe you have blind spots and where we need to complement you with talent who is more experienced and who has maybe done some of these things before. So it comes down to a full package of a person. And um, that's what we mean about we're investing in teams because at the end of the day, many teams will pivot, you know, one business model won't work. You'll have to try something else. You'll have to iterate on product every day. And it comes down to the individuals who are behind that. And, and that's really our, our philosophy about what matters most. And you talked about that you're looking for founders who are like inspiring storytellers. But the, what do you mean by inspiring storytellers? And why? Yeah. what made you think this is important factors? Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, um, it, it was what I answered in, in our TechCrunch article when um, asked what I'm looking for. And for me, it's so much of it comes down to being an inspiring storyteller in that you're starting something, it's not obvious. And there are many people that you need to convince along the way to be part of this journey, whether it's the investor who wants to invest money into you and who wants to continue investing money into you even when things are not going well. And we always know there's gonna be ups and downs. But you also need to be a storyteller to attract talent, to make other people wanna leave their current jobs to go work for you. Um, and, and, and also ultimately to attract your customers, you know, like, what do you stand for? What is, what is your, what does your product stand for? Um, how, how are you, how are you marketing yourself? How are you standing out from what else is available? So much of it comes down to storytelling. Um, and I think it's oftentimes underestimated just sort of how important it is to be able to inspire and sell a dream and a vision, especially when things aren't going, you know, as, as straightforward as, as you would expect. So I think founders who who can do that with nuance and self-awareness um, are setting themselves up for, for success. Right. Thank you. Yes, please, uh, somebody has a question. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, if I go first in that case, so how, how do you do with um, um, co-investment and, and uh, do you then do that together with industrial uh, investors, like uh, corporate investors? Yeah, so as for co-investment, we uh, have probably co-invested with, you know, most most funds in Europe at this point. So we're definitely open to it. Um, as for corporate co-investors, it's absolutely something we're open to doing as well. Um, I think we would prefer two rather than just one to avoid you know, bias yeah, yeah. and also sort of conflict conflict of interest, because um, that might be just one sort of natural follow-on question that comes to strategics having sure. an incentive to wanting to participate. So just to to ensure that everyone is aligned on, on the end goal. Uh, but from an in principle, we're, we're, we're not against it and have, have invested with other corporates, um, you know, historically, whether it's financial corporates, whether it's telecom corporates or others. So it's definitely something we're, we're open to, but probably would want to make sure that interests are aligned. All right. Thank you. So founders, if you have questions, you can click raise your hand and you can ask the questions. Uh, Martin, please. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you have made, uh, how do you view the ed tech market? Is that interest, of interest to you? 
sorry, just to make sure I understood, did you say the ed tech, yeah. like education? Yeah, technology? educational technology market. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. I think it's actually one of those that has had a bit of a push with COVID in that it has accelerated the, the sense of urgency for it. My personal bias historically has always been that it's a fairly budget constrained sector. You know, you have to always think about who's gonna pay and is there enough budget for tools? And if you think about who the payers would be, you know, in Sweden, <laughs> schools don't have much money to pay for things. So, and like, you have to always think about, is there enough budget to be able to pay for this product? And my bias has always been that um, institutions are capital constrained. So who will pay? Well, maybe parents will pay because, you know, they want to make sure that their kid does good in school. So they'll pay for a tutor solution or kind of personalized learning and all that. And then you, you might have success in that. Um, but what I think is interesting now with COVID is that it has really pushed boundaries and I think forced a lot of um, institutions to just rethink learning mechanisms and learning management systems and how to be um, enabling that for, for kind of a next gen learning system. So I do think it's a sector that is ripe for disruption and there will be a lot of opportunity. Um, but, but I just wanted to caveat that with that's how I would just think about the, the dynamics of that sector in that historically it has been harder to penetrate. And if you look at just kind of companies, I can't think of that many kind of meaningful large scale companies in the ed tech space mm. as a reflection of the fact that it's, it's budget constrained. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Sophia, so much for uh, everything that you said and in introducing Index Fund. I, you talked a lot about uh, you being relationship driven, uh, yet you invest global, uh, so globally. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on how you run those relationships, particularly in a remote world? Thank you. Yeah, no, look, it's a great question. And I'm on the board of companies across Europe, so from Stockholm to London, Amsterdam to Istanbul and Turkey. And I probably speak equally frequently with all. It's just a WhatsApp message away. And it's sort of just fostering that sense of um, directness in that and, and sort of just trust that you can always be available um, if, if, if you'd like. Um, but then also the way we think about it just more broadly is we're much more a pull than a push type investor. We won't, you know, some founders might not want to be sort of burdened by their investors. They they feel comfortable running the show and then they want to check in every once in a while. That's totally fine too. Then we adapt to that frequency of communication. Whereas other founders maybe want to check in, you know, almost daily just to sort of like keep, keep us in the loop. And it's part of sort of the morale building and enthusiasm. And that's fine too. So I think it's also, um, like being able to appreciate what kind of frequency of communication and type of communication does each founder want and adapting to their needs in more of a pull way than sort of us pushing. So that's how we try to think about it so that we can, we can make sure we accommodate everyone from a relationship perspective. Thank you. Brings so much light and a very modern way of operating. Uh, before I leave for Maxime and the others to uh, ask your questions, you, uh, I just uh, would like it if you could uh, tell us a little bit more of what you mean with Silicon Valley way of investing. What, what, what are you, could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, I mean, I was referring to it in the context of when Index was started 25 years ago, when venture capital wasn't really an asset class in Europe. It didn't exist institutionally like it does today, but it did on the West Coast. So you had some firms like Sequoia or Benchmark or, or others who, who just have more history and who had created this asset class uh, longer ago and were taking these bold bets and, and doing it sort of the Silicon Valley way, which was foreign in Europe. So that was sort of the, the reference. But I, I would argue that that way of thinking and that Way of investing it, it is is very prominent in, in Europe today, but but it wasn't at the time. Johan, you have a question. Um, yeah, so so you so you guys have started up a, a new seed fund, and where do you guys see yourselves coming in if you look at the stage of angel investors and then going into institution institutional investors? Where would you guys say that? you're located in that process are you going in with the angels or when, when should you contact index for an investment more or less yeah no it's, it's a great question 
I mean, there's there's no sort of limit to when you can. And the so I guess my answer to your question would be both, in that we can come in at the same time as an angel investor. I would maybe say that's practically speaking, maybe less oftentimes than most, because you know, an angel check might be as little as 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 a several ten thousands, and and you know that might be a little low for our two hundred million dollar institutional fund. But if you know angels are constructing a round that's say like a million dollars, we could absolutely be involved in that round. So I think it's sort of a little bit on a of a case by case basis, and if if it's just a very small angel constellation, it's probably on the earlier side for index. But if it's you know a local accelerator, a few local angels, and the round is becoming relatively sizable, sort of in the one to $2 million range, we could absolutely contribute with a 500K check or or even less. So that, that's sort of how I, how I think about it. Super, thank you so much. Yeah, Sophia, thank you so much for the answer. And you also being like board members in, um, in some of the fashion and game companies. I'm just curious, what were some of your challenges working as board members when you're working with those founders? And what are the things founders should be aware of when they are working with investors? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I've been lucky because I haven't had that many real challenges yet as a board member, but I'm sure it will come. Um, and, you know, I'm sure challenges start arising once you're in a, you know, company is not doing well and you need to ask yourself the difficult question of, you know, should we be liquidating this company? Should we be filing for bankruptcy? Like, when are we kind of calling the shots here? And, um, you know, I guess the difference between a board member and a founder is that a board member that is operating with a number of companies will probably think more pragmatically than a founder who will also think emotionally because it's their baby. So I imagine that that can be a challenge. And, you know, sometimes you just need to come to an agreement to agree to disagree and part ways, which is fine. That's part of the game. Um, it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, I'm sure it will happen at some point. Um, but that's maybe just one thing, you know, candidly, one should be mindful of that, um, there are in many ways a lot of joint interests and we're all striving towards the same goal and we're long-term investors and we'll be you know, patient. We can keep doing follow-on rounds. We totally appreciate the need to need to re-strategize, take a step back, rethink and go again. But after a while, we also need to serve our investors who are investors in our funds and we need to return capital to them. So at some point we need to also think about when the exit is appropriate for us. Um, and at that point, you just need to have a, an honest conversation about that. So that's just maybe one thing I'd mention. As for the second question, which I, I think I forgot now, what was the second question? It was about what should you be aware of when working with investors? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, so I can't speak for everyone because every investor has a different investment strategy and, and, and works with founders differently. But what I will say, you know, I think what should be aware of is sort of like what who should I go to for what? Every fund has different strengths and weaknesses and different value proposition. So if you're working with say three investors, I just try to think about which value add can I get from each and how can I try to construct as, as a complementary board as possible so that I'm getting all the different vantage points and inputs that I should be thinking about. And um, from a seed perspective, that's how we went about thinking about the seed fund and that if we collaborate with local funds, then ultimately the founder will get the best of both worlds. They'll get the hands-on geographic proximity, you know, physical closeness and maybe cultural, you know, being culturally relatable and, 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 and sort of more hands-on support, but you'll get the maybe more long-term deep pockets, strong network investor of someone like Index who has history and who has the breadth that maybe a, a local fund doesn't have and, and that's fine. And then you get a, like pros and cons with both. So that's how I try to think about it. Just making sure that you're optimizing your investors in the best possible possible way. You mentioned that you have some long-term commitment from your LPs and what do you mean by long-term? And what is long-term for you? Yeah, I mean, our, our funds are, you know, usually 10 years. 
Um, and I guess our, if you're thinking about, there are many first time funds in Europe right now. And if you're thinking about that, even just like from a, you know, let's make it very academic. You know, if you're a first time fund, if you want to raise a second fund, you need to have something to prove. It's easy to raise your first fund because you're selling it on a dream and a vision. But if you're raising a second fund, say three to four years later, because the money has run out of the first fund, it's going to be harder to do so if you don't have any kind of returns to, to show for from your first fund, or at least companies that have been written up or there has been value creation, even if it hasn't been liquidated. So there might be a more sense of urgency, just very academically speaking, because you need to prove that. But I guess that's where we have some advantage because we're on to our 10th venture fund, our fifth growth fund. We have investors that we've worked with for 25 years. Many of them are the same. So there is a sense of trust and loyalty built in. And so if we say, you know what, we want to extend this fund for another two years. We really believe in a few more companies. They're not quite there yet, but they will be there in two years. That's no problem. But that might be harder to do for a first time fund that has to prove themselves quicker vis-a-vis -vis their investors. Sophia, thank you so much for the uh, audio answer. And does anybody have any more questions? If no, we'll be jumping to the pitching session. There are three hands raised, I think. Okay, I didn't see it here, sorry. Uh, please jump in to ask the questions. It looks like Maxim is talking, but I'm not sure that we can hear, uh, we, we can't hear him. Uh, I, I saw that Maxim and, and Richard had, uh, Richard Vanet had, had uh, uh, already put up their hands before me. Uh, I think Maxim was first, but I, I, I don't think we can hear him right now. So Richard, please go ahead yeah. with your last questions. So uh, just, I mean, follow up questions on, on some things that you already addressed and, and, and that, that also think ties in with the question from Johan. If you look at the regional markets, uh, I mean, south of Sweden, or basically you could say anywhere in Sweden outside of Stockholm, uh, the, I think that the challenge has been and, and still is, I mean, the, the, the pre-seed market is, is functioning very well. And the seed market is also, I think, fairly fine, but the, the big challenge, and, and I mean, that's one of the reasons I think why, why, why Stone, Stone Startups is doing the work that they have, is moving from, from seed stage to, to later stage financing and, and Series A. And, and you already touched upon that, uh, but maybe you can say something more about how, both how you move from, from seed stage to leading or participating in, 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 in the Series A financing, and also if there's something that you feel like founders can do and think about already at, a, at, at an early stage uh, when planning for, for, for a future uh, later stage financing and, and, not, uh, and not try to try to facilitate that. Yeah, um, I'll start with your second question around um, how you can position yourself. I mean, I'm a believer, I'm not trying to be too tactical you know, and trying to like think too much ahead. I think the best thing you can do is to just nail your product market fit and like be sure that customers love your product and um, that you're selling and growing. That should be like absolutely priority number one. And you shouldn't try to just outsmart the system and like be tactical with building too many relationships right and left. Um, and the reality is if you are growing and if the product is loved and it's starting to garner some noise, whether it's through like product hunt or whether it's on LinkedIn, you can tell that, wow, they're really hiring a bunch of people. There must be a lot of momentum going on here. Like most probably an investor will find you because we spent so much of our time researching and trying to see signals of when a company is doing well. So that I just like caveat that as a number one. I guess what you can do if you want to sort of think a little bit ahead is try to identify which are like the top 10 Series A investors that I think could be good partners to me and just casually keep them in the loop. You know, like you guys are, you're not relevant for us now, but we're building X, Y, Z. And I think you're interested because I can see you've done already five investments in this space. Brief, but to the point. And then just kind of keeping them a little bit in the loop so that, so that they're, they're, in, they're, they're aware but 
lastly, also, I think you should be leveraging your seed investors for this and your angels. You know, can they do warm introductions for you? Can they help set you up for success? And and also, you know, spread the word with 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 others. Um, so that's that's um, that's those are maybe some things that I I try to think about. Yeah, Sophia, thank you so much. And we'll move on to the pitching session. And the, each of the founder will have three minutes to pitch. And we'll leave five minutes for Sophia to give feedback and ask questions. And we'll start with uh, our first founder, Vala, please. Please go ahead and present from your computer. Thank you. All right, um, I'm just wondering if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Sorry, it just something went wrong here. Let me just do that again, sorry. Jenny, quick question. Would you be able to show my presentation when I go after one? Yeah. Yes, you can do that. All right, so um, should I go ahead? Yes, please start. Fantastic. Um, so I'm Vala and I'm here to talk about your KIP. 75% of the workforce will be made of millennials by 2025 and 80% of them demand coaching, which is why the coaching industry is the second fastest growing industry globally. But it has some problems and challenges with pricing for client and coach and finding the right coach client match is also difficult. And there's a high level of inflexibility when it comes to logistics and problems with administration and payments. And that's why we built your KIP. It's a twofold solution. We have the AI chatbot coach that functions just like a human coach and the matchmaking marketplace of human coaches. We are in the health and wellness industry and our attainable market is worth 20 billion US dollars. So now to the product. So we recently released our AI chatbot solution in a closed beta. It has contextualized communication and has machine learning capability to understand intent and what people want and feel and adjust the coaching to that. We have seen fantastic results from the um, beta testing where the average session time is more than two hours consecutively inside the app. And I'm more than happy to talk about the details of this, but from our qualitative feedback, we also heard uh, words like love, uh, addictive, recommend, and so on. And by 2022, your KIP will expand the offering to encompass the marketplace where all the payments and administration will run through the app as well. When it comes to competitors, we are the only marketplace that uses AI technology targeting individuals. There's a lot happening in the B2B space, like Coach Hub and BetterUp that received hundreds of millions of investments each. But there's a lack of focus on the individual side where the actual opportunity is. Our adoption strategy, really simplified here, is based on targeting individuals that work in companies that invest in coaching to their senior staff. And it's also to offer your KIP as an employee benefit to organizations, and we are working on developing partnerships. Our business model is uh, based on our offering, where we have a premium licensing model for the AI coach and a revenue split model for the coaching sessions attended on the marketplace. And now is the best time to invest in your KIP because remote work is here to stay all, with all the impact that it has on people. There's also a big shift in awareness and the way that we talk about coaching. Prince Harry, Richard Branson, Bill Gates and more are talking about the importance of coaching. And the app-based uh, coaching is expected uh, to take 67% of the market by 2025. There is an award-winning team behind your KIP. I'm Val and I'm the CEO. I have 15 years of tech experience from startups all the way to Google. Jan is our CDO and he has 25 years of engineering experience uh, joining us after being the director of engineering at PayPal. Our CMO is Philippa, also an ex-Googler and a, an entrepreneur. We also have a top skilled team of engineers and coaches from around the world, from Google, Harvard, but also from startups. And I'd love to talk about each individual um, that we selected very, very carefully. On our advisory board, we have Gabriel, who's an advisor at Antler and other startups. And Tracy, he's a former VP at Google. He's also an executive coach and lectures at Stanford University in this same topic. Pelle is our, also our advisor and he's a former CMO at Apsys and has several, several C-level roles in marketing. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. 
Amazing. Thanks so much for the presentation and congrats on the, on the customer love that you, that you mentioned. Okay. Curious, how have you been distributing the platform and how are you thinking about um, marketability and scalability over time? Thank you. So we have not been distributing it yet because we did a closed beta and we launched the closed beta in a waiting list that was self-generated by people word of mouth where people started talking about there's an opportunity for them to get affordable service uh, when it comes to coaching and people that tested the coach inside the beta started referring other people to get inside the uh, product as well so we are looking to launch the app we're doing some adjustments to make it even better and to fulfill the whole experience and then push it into the uh, app store and uh, google play we are ta talking to them at the moment to so say by September, August, September, it depends on them uh, a lot. And the way that we're looking at distribution is a lot about uh, talking to companies about the uh, benefit, having your KIP as a benefit to them uh, at an affordable price. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think those are, those are just things I would think about, you know, because, um, distributing a product always comes at a cost after a while. And so you wanna just make sure that um, the, the lifetime value you're generating from the user over time will make up for that. But it sounds like you've been really savvy with creating waiting lists and you know thinking about multi multiple different types of distribution strategies. So that's, that's exciting. Thank you, Sophia. And we, we are lucky to have access to um, key networks that give us access to the HR uh, world and also to other companies. But I think, like you said, what we focused on is the customer love. As soon as we got that confirmation, we're ready to push the product out and get it uh, scaled up. Yeah. And how do you envision the usage? Do you envision this to be something like you use it, you get better, then you stop? In which case there might be a risk of just sort of being a short-term product mm -hmm. or do you envision it to be sort of this like continuous feedback loop which you know you keep interacting with and how, how, how are you like trying to think about ensuring that there are these sort of pinch points so that the person keeps coming back to the to the product yeah, and I think that's a great question. We worked so hard on this. One of the key elements that we want to embed in the product is the ability to talk on demand. And what that means is, say that you have a presentation just happening now, like we're having, and you're a bit nervous, you can go in and start uh, talking and chatting to the coach uh, to surface the best skills that you have and be more ready. And these kind of situations happen on a regular basis and very, very often. So it's, a, it's not a goal you attain and then it stops because it's, it's ad hoc. And Sophia, thank you so much. And we will move on with uh, Martin from Activian. Thank you. And could you present them? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm a psychologist and a PhD, and I'm the founder of Acribian. You can take the next slide. I invented a method that teaches children math. So unlike anything else, uh, this method delivers results. Children improve their math results with 60% compared to placebo. But in short, we turn children into math stars using science and game design. Next slide. So we all know math is, can be hard, boring, or too easy for some people. And next slide. We built Count and Meet to help children discover the fun of math. So Massive Entertainment, one of the best gaming studios in the world, gave me guidance in design and game dynamics. And we build the math exercises using the best method in the history of psychology, cognitive behavior therapy. The next slide shows that the children embark on a mathematical journey as they're put in the shoes of a young mathematician. As they master life important math skills, they become the hero of Namberia. Uh, and more precisely, uh, the child uses his or her mathematical powers to free Namberia from the evil prince law. So we can go back to the first uh, previous slide. Uh, and in the far back, you can see the castle where the evil prince uh, resides. And in the front, we have a picture of a game, one of the game uh, pieces, and also the math train. Now, uh, the next slide, please. So we target six to nine-year-olds, uh, actually their parents, and they are half a billion globally. And the next slide shows that 
65% of um, the parents in the UK find the, the product novel in the market. And they're willing to pay £13.99 per month as a subscription. Um, and parents gave us a net promoter score of plus 19 on the beta version. I consider that good, especially for beta version. And actually yesterday we launched Counting Me on App Store in the UK and Sweden for iPad. The next slide shows that we have some competition. And I know what you think, it's another math app, I know, but that's where most people are wrong because unlike others, we have proven results published in top-ranked academic journals and three ongoing gold standard research projects. And unlike others, we have a story-driven adventure. Thinking about Sophia and story-driven, that's what we are about. Uh, that was crafted by a narrative designer from the game success of The Witcher. Next, the slide shows that we have a fantastic team with developers and game designers from a workplace gaming company, King, a serial entrepreneur and also expert marketers as well as advisors from Lego, the gaming industry, and the successful SaaS business, Storytel. And then we, we will have half of the parents paying, uh, still subscribing after three months. We see that we can grow roughly three to five times annually after the first year. And last week, we closed a financial round of 12 million pounds. And we plan to raise a Series A in the beginning of next year, when we have traction to show. And the last slide is, I'll give you a little secret. Why am I doing this? It's because based on the results, my PhD, my published papers, the data that we are collecting, I believe that, and I really mean it. We can actually move Sweden from the 17th place in the PISA math ranking to the third place. And that would be a great contribution that I would be proud of. So the results are there, the tool is working, and it's fun. Um, I think, you know, if you want to see it happen, you know what to do. We can go back to the previous slide, please. Um, and Sophia, I would be very happy to get your opinions on our project, as well as initiate an early contact in case this is this is interesting to you. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Go ahead. Can I ask, how do you think about content creation? Uh, we have uh, a, two narrative designers who, uh, who they were doing it. Uh, we create a story. Right now it's two uh, chapter books filled for uh, nine-year-olds. So we have a lot of audio saying these things aloud. And uh, we are continuously creating an IP, like a world, the realm of Numberia with characters. We actually have one of these uh, things. It's Tia, one of the, uh, the main characters in the game. Uh, so we're trying to create stories about everything. Uh, that is here. So story is super important. We actually have especially good results for children who are less well off. Um, so I think we can also make, we have a story around that, how to make an impact. It's measurable and published data. Yeah, no, that's great. The reason I ask is I work with many gaming companies and that's sort of always top of mind. Like how do you make sure content doesn't run out and you're always sort of Creating, creating more content for, for the users. Um, it's more of a matter of prioritizing right now, I think. Uh, we have 130 pages long uh, PowerPoint that gets a story. So there's a lot to delve into, as well as there's research where we can show stuff success stories from children who used it. And lots of data to back it up with. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think the more you can prove, like, perceived ROI for the buyer that like, I'm getting this in return, I'm getting better at X. Like you can quantify ROI, the the, the stronger buy-in you'll get and you can really, the more you can measure that and relate it back, um, you know, the more you have a solid value proposition. So that's exciting that you're thinking in that way. Yeah, eventually we will have uh, really the parents seeing the first wave training, the effects it had on the specific skill. So they should actually see it, but also see it not watch the kid play the game because that's pretty boring with the parent and all that. Uh, you want to share something, but not all of it. So it should be an asymmetric experience for the parent that is playful and also convincing that it, that it makes a difference. Marty and Sophia, thank you. And the, we'll be moving on to the third founder, uh, Ricard from Vivi. Please, 
Please share your presentation. Will do. Now let's see if we can get this up and running. Um, and you guys can see my screen, yeah? Good. Okay, so Weavy here, Ricardo Hanson. Um, who we are, we are an in-app collaboration SDK API that allows the app developers to boost the end user productivity. Um, the problem we are solving or challenges we are addressing is the increasing expectations right now in the app developer world in terms of BI, ERP, CRM, whatever you want to call it, any B2B for that matter, is the in-app productivity needs to go up, so to speak, just because of all remote working. And you see a lot of big players doing that, like pulling the ecosystem closer to them, uh, aka Salesforce and Microsoft and so on and so forth. Uh, our solution is the B2B low code collaboration SDK and API. And that's kind of the, you know, the boring, you know, template slide. For us, it's all about making head of product, engineers, developers in that team heroes, because it's all about making your product better. And a lot of times you make your product better by doing something that is not core. But the core is like focusing on, you know, making BI for real estate or something like that. So how will you disrupt that or be different? Yeah, because you're gonna make a product overall better to create an ecosystem within your product. So that is our belief and our mission statement is to do that, to be the number one framework or SDK API for developers around the world, to be the most developer friendly uh, product for that specifically. And then back to the boring slides again, in terms of what we actually do, like the business side, so to speak, is like, you know, the reason we do this is because we think collaboration is not a product. Collaboration is a feature that is an integral part in any app and every app, and it should happen where you do work. All the other things we do, stream or sorry, Teams and, and Slack and whatnot, has nothing to do with this. That is still coexist, but it's all about making, you know, something boring as you know, talk about an invoice more efficient. Market potential, according to Forbes at least, is 20 billion for the next couple of years. There's a lot of app developers out there and has been growing pretty rapidly lately because of COVID. So the remote working has like, helped us in a good way. Uh, the key features we help our clients with is messaging, activity feeds, and file sharing. And we give, you know, and also with all these features, we integrate from out of the box with all the big players like Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, and so on and so forth. And it's all in the name to reduce, I guess, like the hurdles and the friction for an app developer to actually venture in to do something that is not their core. Because, you know, the second they do that, they, they huff and puff, and sometimes they need to do it. And we just want to make that fun and frictionless, and again, make them heroes, so to speak. Um, and that kind of resonates with this, like we want, you know, minimum effort for maximum effect, but we focus like from a business value perspective, right? We focus on the KPIs of an app developer. Increase like the user session time, reduce the churn and grow user retention. What they care about, like when they go to bed, so to speak, like regardless of what kind of product they're building, we want to help doing that. And we happen to do that through the vehicle of collaboration to create more of an in-app experience overall. And the secret sauce to this, why it can happen, and we see as our client starts like creating this, like, you know, adding our capability in, in days, it's because we built a ready-to-go product. It's a drop-in UI, a geeky talk, like I'm a geek myself from, you know, 10 years old, whatnot. It's a couple of lines of code and you drop it into your product and it actually works. And you just style it so it looks like yours. And then you can go look like a hero for your users and say like, look what I'd added for our next release. And my, a lot of our clients say like, this is the biggest release to be done in ages because it's so much happening, uh, but still not part of the core, right? Right now we have pretty good traction, uh, you know, a, a bi-directional love, even with you know, big, within quotes, boring brands, but also with cool startups all over the world. Everything from IBM using it in their Watson Health portfolio with doctors talking about x-rays to TMO about creating enterprise apps for consolidation of, uh, of their business apps, so to speak, into one UI, into cool like companies like Lobby Series creating you know, commercialized real estate BI tools and so on and so forth. And, and this is a product in market since, you know, 2019. And we had a pretty good growth last year, 515. And looking like a 3, 4x this year uh, with the existing body we're doing right now. And, and fundraising, you know, specific, we are in the midst of doing that, which is, a, I wouldn't call it a nightmare. It's super fun, but you have to talk to a lot of people. And, and, and we're looking into do a seed right now uh, to, to 
expand our bandwidth because right now we're kind of maxed on all corners. We're, we're already 20 people, so it's kind of a semi-big vehicle, uh, but we need to add more people and more resources. So that's us. Thank you very much. Uh, Sophia, please go ahead. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, look, it sounds like you've gotten some sophisticated, sophisticated customers sort of already garnering interest for the product, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, I, I'd i really just love to understand more kind of how, how it feeds into workflow and sort of are you thinking yourself as um, sort of being a daily use case, a weekly use case, and sort of how, how ingrained into the organization will you be? So we're not ingrained to the customer's organization, right? So we ingrained to an app. Like QuickBooks could be a client of ours or HubSpot or Marketo. And workflow is a really good like name to use or word because that's what it's about. Like we don't, we help our clients to help their users to not break up the workflow. Because right now, if I do, like if I'm in QuickBooks, I want to talk about an invoice. I need to break up that workflow, so to speak, and then go to Teams or Slack or an email and attach that invoice and ask questions about it. Or if I want to talk about a data point in a BI tool, I have to leave that workflow, so to speak. So like in all our clients, um, our, our technology is like very embedded into everyday use. So every time they log into their tool, sharing an X-ray, for example, in IBM's case, they're using our technology to talk about that X-ray, second opinions across hospitals, for example. So it's not used on a daily or weekly, it's like used in every session, literally. And in almost all cases, what I'm hearing from the clients at least, there's 100% usage almost from the users, from them, right? Using our technology uh, embedded into their app. It's white label, right? So the users don't know they're using Weedy. It's like it's a pure app developer play. Very cool. How big is your team? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, we're tw uh, 20 people today, 2-0. Uh, primarily uh, sales and marketing. We're actually an American company. I, I moved to the States in 2014. I'm within quote stuck in, in Malmo right now because of COVID, but I kind of love it. Uh, but so, so but primarily like we have uh, 14 people in uh, LA where I live otherwise. And then we have six people actually here in Sweden, accidentally or like, you know, weirdly enough, my CMO that I hire is from Boston, but she lives in Malmo. And then my dev team I have here in Sweden and this dev team, yeah, I, it's only four people creating all this magic. I've been working with them for 20 plus years. This is my fifth company I'm building. And I just kept this like, you know, over the years, like this team is pretty good. So right now I can draw a line on a whiteboard and we all know what we're talking about. And then we just go and build it. Uh, and, you know, so that's like, you know, and it's also compared to the States, insanely inexpensive. I mean, they're well paid here, but it's not even, you know, close to what you have to pay for like the engineering quality they have over in the States and then, uh, you know, to retain them as well. So that's our team size today. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ricard and Sophia. And the next one, we will have uh, Henrik from Toco. Henrik, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, hello. Let's see if I can manage. Okay, hello everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. You can? Okay, great. So hello, my name is Henrik Carlson. I'm the principal founder of Talk Online, and we're a group of techies around the world that have the passion to build innovative products. And I'm here today to talk about, sorry, I have a problem with my microphone. One second. Okay, I'm here to talk about the next product revolution. So during COVID, people had a lot of extra time to build side, side projects and startup projects. And as we know, the approach management tools, they just exploded. But everybody knows how hard it is to really build a successful project. And no, one, no company have really simplified this process until now. So we're introducing community collaborations for star projects. And I'll explain that in a bit, but here you can see our amazing user interface and an example of how users search and interact in the platform. So the core essence of talk is that anyone can start projects 
and assign talent as easy as shopping on Amazon. So you can see how you more or less drag people into your project and they get activated and start working. And you can do this in a very short amount of time, in a few minutes. Now I'll show you how this is done. So here you can see a profile where somebody has selected their skill. And here you can select what type of work you want to involve them with. It can be like a weekly advisory. It can be a certain set of hours per week that you can have as a subscription, or you can enter custom hours that really fits your economy and your business needs. And these people will be transferred into your project panel where you can manage it, reassign tasks, and, and you can see more in the video tool we have built here where you can communicate with your team, uh, you have your one-on-ones with your experts, your advisors. So essentially it's building blocks to create projects and startups. And instead of you know suffering and, and having a hard time finding the right people, the right tools, the right experts, we have everything in-house. So not only can you start one startup project, you can run multiple ones parallel in our platform. And we believe this especially helps non-technical founders to get their projects up running fast because that's what matters. Um, and not only that, we took this further. Um, so we created a, a collaborative feature. Um, so you can open up your star project with the community and get dedicated people, fangirls, fanboys that might be interested in the same thing that you're building. So you can find your potential co-founders, your potential new team members, or just have people that will help you to build you know, the success that your dream project uh, deserves. And um, yeah, it's a cool feature. Um, and this is the team. Just give you a short overview. Uh, we're 12 people currently, uh, and we're distributed around five time zones, uh, everywhere from America, Europe, Sweden, uh, Russia, and India. And yeah, let's talk a little bit about the market. So, uh, Henrik, uh, we're a little bit running out of time here. Uh, maybe we can. Uh, are, are we running short on time? Yes. Okay. So let's skip through uh, the market and just gonna talk a little bit uh, where we are. Uh, we're currently raising a seed round and launching our new UI next month, uh, and we're rolling out the project feature in quarter three. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is our growth trajectory. We, um, we have both automated and manual strategy to um, hopefully receive critical mass in 2022 uh, with our products. And this is a little glimpse of our mobile, upcoming mobile app. Um, and that's about it. Thank you for listening. And if you have any for questions, here are our contact details. Thank you. Sophia, we still have some time for questions. That's great. Thank you so much for thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I think the whole idea of sort of seeking community is is really powerful. And you're seeing how that has been growing more and more with the lifetime of the internet. And what's interesting is also um, you know, there's so many horizontal community interaction plays, but making yeah. it more verticalized and use case specific, I think is really interesting. So, um, you know, in, 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 in that sense, sir, how did you come up with that idea of like making it more verticalized and- um, So, um, me and my co-founder and, and some other people in the company, we, we have worked in the industry for quite a bit and, and um, we saw the pain, pain problems of 
of building a, a great team of, of, you know, succeeding with your project, finding, you know, their early adopters, the, the fangirls, fanboys, and, and we just started by, by building an adversary service where you could, uh, you, you could have your, you know, dream mentor, your dream technical CTO, whatever, uh, you know, advising your company. So we, we started with, with, the, with the video interaction bit. And, and then from there, we just evolved it further um, into um, creating these beautiful multiple projects that you can do. And, and just like I said, like one click orders on Amazon, it should be really easy to assign people to your projects. And, and I mean, you can run your main startup, you can have your job, uh, but you, you can still have more stuff going on and, and people working, you know, a few hours per week or as much as you can afford. I mean, in our platform, you can choose to work from four hours a week or full time. It, it's really dynamic and, and that's the power of this product. Thank you so much, Henrik. Uh, we'll move on to Martin from Sentient AI. Uh, Thank you. Henrik, could you please unshare the screen? And the... Hi, guys. Uh, so let me then uh, share my screen. Let's see if I can get this. So, right. I uh, hope you can see the screen. Uh, otherwise, yes, let works. me know. Okay, so my name is Martin Rufeld. I'm the CEO and founder of Sentian. And we have a goal to build the best possible industrial AI applications there are. And um, uh, so far we've built two AI as a service uh, products for the industry. And they target a range of different pain points that the industry is facing when it comes to smart industry, sustainable industry, and smart optimization. And what we discovered is that the two products we have, they fit with one customer in almost all the cases. So when we talk to the customers, they are interested in both of the uh, products. And that's interesting. Um, and let's see if I can, uh, they're based on two technical breakthroughs. Uh, so the first one is in uh, model-based reinforcement learning, which is a technology we've made to work really, really well for, uh, for industrial control systems. Uh, and the other one, sorry, uh, the other one is in uh, optimization, more mathematical optimization, which we use in the area of uh, supply chain, logistics, and, and various planning tasks. So if we take the first one, sentient controller, which is focusing on the control industry, control system for the, the manufacturing and process industry, they have PLCs and SCADA and all of that. And they even have these advanced process control system. They're all made in the last century. They're all past peak. They're not cloud, expensive to install and run. We now have AI analytics and predictive analytics. It brings new opportunities to solve various pain points in the industry. They're faster and, and cheaper than the old generation, but they're very much uh, uh, consultancy based. What we built is a new generational product in this area that can really replace the APCs and solve a lot of these problems. So it's a scalable product, it's fast to install, it has these features coming from model-based reinforcement learning that are really sticking with the customers. So that's the first uh, product and it's really valuable solutions for these customers who are solving key pain points. The other one is in what we call Sentient Planner. It's, it's also based on technical uh, breakthroughs. Uh, we, we actually broke the current world record in nonlinear optimization in the QAP category, which is a sort of a generalization of planning. And we use that for scheduling, for supply chain and logistics optimization. So also here, key pain, pain points for, for the industry to solve. And we did this with uh, Planner. We, we actually brought new AI, modern AI, together with old technical. And, and that's how we could uh, break that uh, world record. So we're extremely fast. So if we summarize, Sentient Controller, it's a new generation of, of control optimization for manufacturing and process industry, acting on a 15 billion USD market uh, for these systems. 
uh, and, and quite revolutionary compared to what they have today. And St. John Planner, so it's a lot faster optimization, big market in, in supply chain scheduling, uh, logistics optimization and, and planning. And if we look at the company, so uh, we built the company since 2016, building the team, building the technology, building the product. We spent a lot of time on the product for the last year. We're now ready for expanding first into Europe and then other markets with this, I would say, very profitable uh, kind of, of technology and product. And we're looking to raise 2 million euros uh, now. Yeah, that's Sentian. Thank you so Amazing. much, Martin. Sophia. Amazing. No, I mean, very cool. It's certainly like so timely now, you know, in terms of how to, how to think about different use cases for this technology. And it sounds like you've identified this core use case where it can be applied. Um, so just thinking like, how, 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 how are you thinking about go to market and, ah, and positioning well, yourself versus <laughs> peers out there? Yeah, it's, uh, we, we do both um, uh, direct sales. Uh, so we have a small sales team that we're now building up, but we're primarily going to look for partners and we have a few partners already. Uh, so we're talking about system integrators uh, and technical uh, consultants, uh, but also white labeling this technology. There's very large industrial players that do uh, their own advanced process control systems today. And this is uh, really replacing what they have. And they get a modern version solving these key po pain points that the industry has. So we see a lot of interest from these guys when it comes to uh, exploring the possibility of uh, white labeling this. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, exciting. Um, cool. I don't know if we have time for more questions or if we want to move oh, on. Oh, we do. Please go okay. ahead if you have. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Um, no, I mean that's that's super interesting. And 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 have you already gotten some feedback from from potential users at the stage? Sure. We we have some. Um, uh, uh, well, first of all, we did consulting in the beginning. We self funded, uh, and um, uh, so this is our first round that we're doing. And uh, we learned a lot on that way. So we've been doing all kinds of industrial projects, only focused on on the industry. And we have test implementations on the, both of the products uh, and we're now looking to scale this. So we spent you know, the Corona year on productization a lot uh, and uh, uh, we're getting very good traction with the, the customers we're, we're talking to. I only just today actually got two accepts uh, from, from uh, projects that will start uh, in the coming months. So, so it's good. Martin, thank you so much. And you will move on to Anna. Yes, thank you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can Great. Hear you so let's talk about how to disrupt the traditional market. Um, soon? There we go. Okay. So most of us like to have a new and fresh haircut, but not very ma many of us like to plan one month ahead and uh, make booking far ahead. And most hairdressers are talented and very charming, but they are not very interested or equipped to do administration and marketing. But still, most of them are uh, company owners and uh, self-employed. So what? Uh, simply want to do is to connect the hairdresser and the customer via our platform in our salons so and make uh, the booking easy and effective for the customer and make the business uh, risk-free for the hairdresser and they can focus on what they're really good at which is cutting hair. Uh, so what we do is that we, we provide uh, units with three to six shares where the hairdressers uh, book the share for free. A customer book on their mobile phone and confirm and pay via Swish. We only offer haircuts, uh, always 20 minutes, always 349 crowns. And then we share the profit with the hairdresser. And the better uh, customer reviews they get, the more money they get. Uh, and this is a hook that, is, uh, that I really love about our business model, that we uh, are always one week ahead in the cash flow. The uh, customer pays in advance, 
the hairdresser gets paid the week after, and we are one week ahead with the cash flow always. Talking about money, our success factor factor is a strong and fast expansion. It's a volume concept. Um, so our goal is to open 120 units within five years. Um, and to our calculation, uh, each unit is a cash flow positive after about a year and the company in about three years. And the best part, in five uh, years, we uh, calculate have an income on uh, 591 million Swedish crowns with 111 million Swedish crowns profit. And that's kind of irresistible. Uh, and talking about irresistible, here is the core team. So, uh, so it's me, Björn and Jenny. And we have combined uh, experience and uh, expertise in reach, reaching the market and creating customer friendly solutions. And uh, really focus on using tech for automation and building a scalable business. Uh, and where we are right now. So we started our first location uh, in uh, eight months ago, and we've done almost 3,000 cuts by now. We have great customer reviews and I uh, identified a target group who likes new tech and hates standing in queues. Um, and uh, to get where we are now, we take about a year or two for someone else. Um, we are strong in marketing, we do have a trust, and the team is uh, familiar with both digital and how to uh, work with hairdresser business and hairdressers, with, which is kind of an unusual combination. So what we're looking for right now, uh, we want to grow and we want to grow fast. Uh, so we want someone to hold our hand and we need uh, 10 to 15 million uh, switch crowns to do it. And the money will be used for investments in new locations and expanding the team. Thank you. Very cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, I love the energy and I love also the... Um, kind of natural lock-in effect you get with the sort of sense of credit, which is which is smart, I think, just to drive loyalty and 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 you know just user user longevity. Um, so that's really exciting. You know how 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 have you been marketing the solution and how you've been trying to to position yourself as you as you're distributing? Yeah. Uh, we market ourselves uh, the usual ways Facebook, Instagram, Google. Uh, we also have uh, a sister company with a strong brand in Sweden, Gents. So we use, uh, well, we piggyback on their reputation to, to have the initial trust. And then it's a lot of mouth to mouth. We have very happy customers. That's great, that's great. Very cool. And then how, how, how is the retention looking? Are you, how, do you have enough data to be able to show kind of how frequently they're using you and you know how, how that's trending over time or maybe it's too early to tell? Uh, it is a bit early to tell. We have some customers that have been uh, come to us like over 20 times already. I don't know how to find the time to cut their hair so often. Uh, and we have some uh, customers that have just come to us once. But I would say that most customers do come back. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, we will move on to uh, Maxim for Atlantic 3D. Ron, can you hear me? Yes, finally. Okay, works. cool. Yes, I'm very happy about that. Um, let me share my screen, but if I may make a comment, uh, Martin uh, from AI, forgot the company. You have a really interesting product that uh, I'm interested to be your customer. So <laughs> that's something that uh, I would like to discuss afterwards. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, um, hello, my name is Maxim Plachetniuk. I'm CEO and founder of Atlant 3D Nanosystems. We are a Danish-based company. Uh, we are two years old, but uh, within two years, uh, we built a quite uh, um, substantial technology that we believe is disruptive revolutionary. And we are the, um, um, we already within two years received quite good 
traction with um, large companies. So we are B2B, B2 uh, government uh, company. Uh, what challenge we solve as a company, uh, you probably heard with the COVID situation that the shortage of the microchips, different sensors create a huge problem for automotive, for semiconductor and many other industries. So simply we, within half a year, we will lack of uh, cars or any other means of uh, smart electronics. <clears throat> so to make such a microchip, Right now we need either a big uh, lab and uh, production facility in Asia, or there is US and uh, European government decide to actually relocate some of the microfabrication in Europe and US and uh, safe, uh, make safe uh, manufacturing. But the challenge with all of these devices is that they need a huge infrastructure. They are very expensive. And mm -hmm. in order to make such one device, you need at least one lab and you can imagine all of these people working just on this small device. What we bring, we bring standalone smart manufacturing system and uh, technology that you can upload the CAD file, submit to the, the printing job and then get the micro device out of this machine. So we build in the uh, one way we can call it uh, for simple words, atomic layer 3D printer for micro devices but it's much way more advanced system than 3D printing. It's advanced manufacturing technology when uh, not one sample can be manufactured, but many samples, many devices can be manufactured in one process. So we call our product a nanofabricator. And um, <clears throat> this, this is something unique that we bring and we think this, uh, this uh, can and, and already disrupt in the market. Why it's uh, so important? Because with this approach, direct processing approach, we can reduce the cost of prototyping and manufacturing by at least 97%. Uh, it's 10 times faster. And with our technology, we have a huge availability of materials. You can combine metals, uh, semiconductor, oxides, many a material that needs to make a micro device, microchip working. And more important, we can make devices on a very complex surfaces, which is not possible to make at all with existing technologies. So imagine you have a CAD file or a digital file, 3D file, you upload to the machine, you send for printing, and then in the end you have a device. It's as simple as is. This is a new value chain that didn't exist in the semiconductor micro device industry so far. We are the first who bring in this, and this is something unique as well. We have the whole uh, range of uh, products in, uh, in a pipeline. Of course, we didn't develop all of this. We developed so far Nanofabricator 2 and Nanofabricator 1. And together with NASA, we developed Nanofabricator Lite. This is a product exactly for R&D market. But we envision for industrial manufacturing, large-scale equipment that can manufacture with very high throw output. This is very first print image that we made last year with our initial prototype. This is very, uh, I probably it looks a little bit ugly for you, but this is very important image. Why it's important? Because each letter was printed with a separate thickness. So you can imagine the A was printed with about four nanometers. The letter T was printed with about 30 nanometers. With existing methods with how it's done now, you need about one week just to make such letter. This was done in just uh, half an hour. So this is just to show you how fast it can be done. <laughs> what we do, we bring in initially our equipment to the market, so sales of the equipment and consumables to this, but we're looking into the future and we want to not only sell the equipment, but also establish manufacturing as a service and develop new applications for, for new markets, for biomedical for space, for um, uh, power electronics, for batteries, for automotive and many other industries where the micro devices are essential. We were already working with customers in uh, uh, developing new materials for microelectronics, we're developing uh, micro sensors, we're developing micro packaging for micro LEDs and display and micro reactors for the pharma and chemical industry. Uh, the market, as you can imagine, is huge. There are a lot of applications. We have a very targeted approach. And uh, 
we believe that this is a disruptive technology that has a huge potential in in uh, in the future and uh, um, there are many possibilities where it can go we now focusing on something that makes the value for our current customers sensors and optics and we uh, have a very targeted approach that we plan to expand further on our team uh, is uh, highly educated most of us phds with also people with uh, experience in entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship and business development we have a very strong advisory board that uh, support us in business development and bringing this to the market uh, most of our team uh, uh, it has expertise in one of the key technical domain it's chemistry it's a uh, uh, micro technology, machine development, it's software development. Uh, we uh, highly dedicated. Uh, we are now 15 people on uh, on a board, and uh, we're planning to expand the team further on uh, by uh, more bringing commercial and sales people because our product nanofabricate light one and two already for the market, and we want to push it to, uh, heavily to to for sales. We're looking now for. 12 million in Series A, and uh, we uh, already collaborate with a number of companies. Uh, our traction to confirm our need uh, quite large. So besides the development and the uh, partners that support us, we have ongoing uh, eight uh, uh, pilot projects that we converted into sales. We have uh, several customers that even claim that they want to buy five, 10 machines per year. And uh, we are lacking the capital to scale uh, the, the sales of our machines. One of the key customers that we have now, Merck and NASA, as I mentioned, NASA is very interested to explore our technology for in-space manufacturing. So this is very important because our technology is very versatile and it can work without major modification in space. So this is something very critical and not very common. We work also uh, with Sony and Sony is one of our investors as well. Yeah. Nice uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's all on my side. Uh, that's thank you. Yeah, we'll leave one question for Sophia. Yeah, I mean, look, congrats on getting getting these customers. I'm curious, are they switching from alternative solutions to to choose you, or is this like a greenfield opportunity and it's a new type of product for them? It's both, it's new type of product um, and it's also a possibility to switch, but we understand that the, the market we target, so uh, advanced manufacturing micro devices, it's a very high barrier market. So we bring in our solution with a high possibility to integrate in existing uh, equipment and existing processes. So it's not that we kill everything that what they do. We understand that they invested a lot and we just give additional functionality now with idea that we can take over the, uh, the existing methods and bring our technology as a standalone technology later on. Well, thank you so much for everybody who joined us in the pitching session. Um, this is coming to the end of our discussion. Uh, Maxim, uh, feel free to unshare your screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everybody joining us today. Uh, Sophia, I'm just wondering for the entrepreneurs who would like to follow up with you, how should we be reaching out to you? I mean, please feel free to just reach me directly on, uh, on my email or via LinkedIn. And the, uh, Johan, uh, I think you have some final words of the, uh, why should the investor be looking into a uh, school in that region? Um, yeah, exactly. And as we've seen today, there is uh, quite the broad array of companies that is being built in Skona and they are very much uh, into technology and doing quite uh, advanced stuff. So I think this is the perfect opportunity to get in as a larger investor, seeing these companies grow and the entire ecosystem growing. Uh, and not to forget, we're the most densely populated area in Sweden with uh, universities. We got a lot of knowledge and quite low living costs. So you can build great companies to, and still have quite a lot of leverage in your money uh, uh, that is uh, within the company. 
more or less. So more money to Skåne and uh, start looking outside the global or the uh, capitals in the, in the Nordics. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Johan. And the Sofia was so excited to have you here. I'm really sorry about the technical issues in the very beginning, but I think the whole session went quite well. And just wondering, Sofia, do you have a final words or advice for the entrepreneurs who are with us today? I mean, yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, look, I think all the pitches were extremely thoughtful. My advice is just to really keep iterating on product and honing in on that. And um, that, that will always come first. And then if, if users love the product, traction crap traction financially will, will, will come as a follow-on. So that would be my advice. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Uh, this is coming to the end of the session. Um, we will so, follow up with you, uh, Sophia, and so, everybody Sorry, else. can I yes, start? Sophia, would you mind sharing yes. your email address in that case? Uh, I will connect uh, the founders who joined okay, the Facebook, fine. Sophia. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank yeah, you. Thank you guys thank for you joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sunny and Startups, Gona. Yeah, thank you.